It's fine. It's not actually. Ed will give us the uh, the signal in about a minute or two. Yeah, just waiting for folks to filter in here. Okay. Do, 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 do. Feel free to keep talking. It's all good. <laughs> You're not. So do you have people right live now. in the bookstore there, or is this entirely virtual event? There are people online watching, but nobody in the store besides us. <laughs> okay, okay, Randy, why don't you go ahead and get going? Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Randy. I'm with the events team here at the University Bookstore in Seattle. Tonight, we are very excited to have with us David Yoon to discuss his new book, City of Orange. Also joining us is author Edward Ashter. The books that we discuss today will appear in the chat box there. Feel free to please ask any questions you may want of the authors. Please put it in the Q&A section and not the chat area. And this show is being recorded for future viewings on our YouTube channel. I want to introduce our authors tonight. David Yoon is the New York Times bestselling author of Frankly in Love, Super Fake Love Song, and for adult readers, version zero in City Orange. He is a William C. Morris Award finalist and an Asian Pacific American Award for Young Adult Literature Honor Book recipient. He's co-published, he's co-publisher of Joy Revolution, a random house young adult imprint dedicated to love stories starring people of color. David grew up in Orange County. California and now lives in Los Angeles with his wife, novelist Nicola Yoon, and their daughter. Edward Ashton he is the writer of three novels, Three Days in April, The End of the Ordinary, and Mickey Seven. He's also the author of many short stories. He lives in a cabin in upstate New York, and he's, he's the first to say that it's not that cabin. And in his free time, he enjoys teaching quantum physics to sullen graduate students and whittling. So gentlemen, thank you so much for being here with us tonight. I do want to read one other quick thing from the LA Times about your book, David. Oh, yeah. uh, in, in reference to the city of Orange, the LA Times writes, the book works because the book's main concern is the eternal question relevant to both the apocalypse and everyday life of how we're supposed to go on, how we're supposed to go on when living seems impossible in the face of all that's been lost. So gentlemen, please tell me about the book. Thanks for having us. It's nice to be here. I wish I could be there in person. Yeah, thank you, uh, David. I really wanna first thank you personally for writing this book and for giving me the opportunity to read it. It, it was an absolute joy. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed it so much. I've been through it twice. Um, for for oh, wow. reasons that'll be clear to anyone who's 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 read it or who's going to read it, um, the, the second read through has a completely different balance than the first one. This is I, I'm not someone who often reads the same book twice, um, but but this one you, oh, you don't want to do that. I, I'm just going to put that out there. I'm glad you liked it. I can't take a compliment. I'm terrible terrible at it. <laughs> <laughs> so, thank you so much. That means a lot. Um, especially I, I I started Mickey Seven and. I mean, I'm at page, what, 30, 37, I think. And it's amazing. I, I'm just like tearing through it. It's an absolute joy to read. It's cracking me up. You know, it's hard to be funny. Funny is difficult and you're totally pulling it off. And I, I love it. So I'm, I don't know. I have other books to read, but I, I want to kind of sneak this one in before them. <laughs> don't tell anyone I said that. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. I, I've, I've often... I've often said that humor in writing is is like hot sauce in cooking. If you put the right amount in, it works. But boy, it's really easy to go too far and just turn oh, yeah. the book into a farce. <laughs> and yeah, that that's that's something I try really hard not to do. So I'm 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 glad that you feel like I may be striking the balance there. Yeah, no, it's 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 the perfect amount of hot sauce, and I do like hot sauce. Um, so and, you know, because I think I said I, I really want to um I want to get I want to give you a chance to um give us your sort of five minute elevator pitch for, for City of Orange. So if, if we buy this book, mm. which all of us are definitely going to do, uh, obviously, what, do we, what are we in for? What are we gonna get? Uh, so City of Orange is a post-apocalyptic story. It's about this guy who wakes up, he's got a head injury of some sort and he knows that the world has ended. He's in this desolate landscape. 
Uh, all he knows is that the world has ended. He doesn't know how, and that his wife and, and baby daughter are out there somewhere and he needs to find them. Um, so that's what you learn within like the first few pages of the book. And you slowly learn that it's, it's a different kind of apocalypse. Um, it's certainly not that the end of the world is not what you expect. And it's more of like a character portrait, it's a more intimate portrayal of an apocalypse. It's, it's more about not so much the mechanics of disaster, but what do you do afterwards? You know, how do you, how do you cope and how do you, how do you learn to live uh, when the world, as you know, it has become totally unrecognizable. Um, and it's kind of a feeling that uh, I think a lot of us can relate to. Some people have, have called it, they're like, is this a pandemic book? And I was like, no, actually I wrote it. Like I started it like eight years ago when, um, when our, our daughter was just a baby. And you know, when you, I mean, you know, you have kids, like when you have a baby, you're just in it. And it's almost like your world shrinks down to a tiny point. Everything turns upside down. And you got to just scramble and figure it out. Um, so that actually was the inspiration for the novel was uh, was having our first child, and 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 I was like, my God, everything as we knew it is different. I know what's at stake now. I know it's like family and friends, you know, and all the other stuff I used to care about in my thirties, don't care about anymore. Um, and also, uh, it's just us in this almost like quarantine like environment. Um, and so I was like, this is a good metaphor for like apocalypse, you know? <laughs> and so I figured let's, let's play with these ideas of uh, figuring out, learning quickly what's, what's at stake in life. And then what would happen if something happened to what was important to you and how would, how would you figure it out? You know, um, that to me is like survivalism. So when I first started this book, you know, after reading the, the back jacket and reading the first couple of chapters, I thought I had it nailed. I thought I knew what I was doing. I thought, okay, this is, I've, I've read plenty of end of the world books. This is an end of the world book. It's a survivalist book. We're, we're going to see how this goes. About midway through, I thought, boy, I, I really had that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is not at all about the end of the world. And then by the time I got to the end, I thought, yes, it is. This is a book about the end of the world, but I had conceived the end of the world incorrectly. And I had to revisit my own thoughts about what what does it mean for the world to end you know it, it, it it's certainly not the dissolution of the planet that's not ever going to happen at least not any time scale that we understand so is it the end of the human species is it the end of civilization or is it something more personal do, do, is, is that yeah. sort of an idea you were playing with i mean i was just i was thinking a lot about apocalypse and how i love apocalypse stories um i love the road i love station 11 all those great books um and I love the apocalypse as like a literary vehicle, you know, because it's on the one hand, you've got like the Mad Max fantasy where the apocalypse is just awesome. And all, all the stupid crap in your life, it just gets swept away and forgotten. You know, you don't have to do homework anymore. There's no more taxes to pay. You just get to have your, your awesome bag and your Jeep, your custom vehicle and just go. And uh, you have a very clear purpose in life. Um so it's it's almost like camping in that way. I, I know we we're just talking about how you're a big hiker and how it clears your head. Um, I think apocalypse kind of shares something with that, uh, that the idea of apocalypse anyway. Um, and then at the other end of the spectrum, the apocalypse is just really wretched. Like it just sucks. Like if you read The Road um, or watch the movie The Rover with Robert Pattinson, actually, um, it's a terrible place to be. And it's it's like, it's mostly about, making the world, you know, totally unrecognizable and changing norms or erasing norms altogether. And then just seeing what happens to people, see how we deal with it. There's a lot of um, practical uh, use for this device, I think, because it happens all the time in life. You know, someone, you know, could, could divorce you, like your wife could divorce you. You could lose your job all of a sudden. You could, you know, suddenly lose your leg. Um, that's kind of an apocalypse too, because your social context is completely changed. And it's up to you to figure out, well, okay, I can't just give up. You know, I can't just <laughs> like curl into a ball and cry for hours. So I got to do something. Um, and that struggle was really what I was interested in when I, when I was writing this book. So I think that's, that, without spoiling anything, like that's kind of what you're talking about is it's not quite the apocalypse you think it is, but it's still an apocalypse um, in its own way. Absolutely. And I, I think, you know, the, the way that it, it plays out, 
at least for me, hit me 10 times harder than, than, than some of the books that what you're talking about, um, where, where there actually has been, you know, a nuclear war or something like that. All and right. I, I find it really interesting what you're saying about um, this idea that, you know, in some way, like an apocalypse could be awesome. You, you're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're in your big dune buggy with like uh, some guy strapped to the front for some reason, and you're driving down the road. I, I have a brother who's, yeah, I have a brother who's uh, <laughs> who's a little bit of a doomsday prepper sort of person. He has a farm and he cans his own, all of his vegetables and he's always like threshing wheat or something. I, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, that's amazing. And, and I'm talking <laughs> about this and I'm like, but you can't get to 10 o'clock in the morning without two cappuccinos. <laughs> you talk about this, but if this actually occurs, you will last it today. You know. it today. <laughs> but you know what? I Not understand. What you think. But I, I used to, okay, it's easy to make fun of preppers and everything, because why not? I think everything's funny. Preppers <laughs> are funny. But I do understand, like, how addictive it is to, to have a project. You know, it's such a clear project, too. And there's endless, it's an infinite, endless project. You can always work on your little bunker. You can always, you know, come up with new tools and, and tricks and ways to can things and prepare. And it's a never ending project because the world probably is not going to end. It just it doesn't happen that way. Um, but while you're alive, it gives you something really fun to do. So I don't know if you look at it as a hobby and at, at, at its most sort of innocuous, um, it can also become a worldview, which I think is kind of, I don't know, I'm not sure what that is because it's so cynical and dark. I'm just like, chill out, man. It's not all that bad out there. Um, but yeah, I totally, I under, I mean, I, I have like my little bag and I'm like obsessed with Swiss army knives and having everything I need uh, for whatever, um, especially when I travel. And so I understand that urge that it's, it's like a, um, it's like a desire for agency, I think, uh, in a world where we just don't really have that much agency. Yeah, I, I, I can appreciate that. Um, and it, I, I totally get what you're saying about having a project. You know, I, uh, I said, I live in the middle of the woods. I've spent the last few weekends carving out a, a half mile hiking trail just around through my property and, and uh, you know, covering up, uh, covering up mud piles with punchins and things like that. I, how do you I carve a, a how do you carve a, a, a trail, a hiking trail? Uh, with, with a, a chainsaw and a whole lot of landscaping ties. <laughs> Wow. <laughs> yeah. that's cool so, it, it's a project it's it's a lot of work but but at the end of the day i have a trail i can walk on yeah, whereas at the sweet. end of the day my brother has a lot of canned beans just just a lot of canned beans i'm not really <laughs> sure what you're gonna do with them it's, be, beans aren't that great you know and when you can them they're 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 even less they're even less worse stuff, but, I mean, like the question it's a hobby. It's yeah a it's hobby. a hobby is i mean my the question my wife always asks is like is would it be even worth living like it would just suck you know, let's say yeah, a meteor that, hit. That's an open question. Yeah. D depending on where you are and exactly how the apocalypse has played out. Uh -huh. yeah. there, there, there is certainly the the concept of the living and being the dead. I mean, that's 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 a phrase that's gotten tossed around a lot. Yeah, that's very true. Yeah. So um, your, your book, City of Orange, has been compared to The Martian. I mean... Um, I got them all fooled. I, I, I welcome the comparison. <laughs> I mean, Mickey, Mickey Seven, uh, if you look on the cover of that, was also compared to The Martian. I sometimes feel like every speculative or semi-speculative book for the last three years has been compared to The Martian. Well, it's but, almost but like your, its own little sub But your book is is like, it, it is set in space and the voice is so approachable and and just likable, you know, that I actually see the, the, the um, connection with The Martian. I'm like, this, yes. If you like The Martian, you're definitely going to like this. I think if you like The Martian, maybe because there's like a, a, a weird survival um, arc to City of Orange, uh, that you'd probably like it for that because it's... Yeah, that's, that's true. I mean, it, it is, it's interesting because if you look at City of Orange, it certainly shares certain aspects with The Martian. The, the sort of one man against the environment, uh -huh. All right, the first yeah. half of the book. Um, that's that that is 100% the Martian you know there's there's Mark Watney trying to grow potatoes and you know you have Adam trying to open up a can you know and, and it's, it's you know it's, it's a very similar sort of challenge in some ways you've even got the, the sort of barren landscape that you have in, in mm -hmm. the Martian compared to the landscape that you know that Adam finds himself in in City of Orange um, but I think tonally 
it's quite different. Um, you know, if you look at Mickey Seven, I think there are tonal similarities, but that the the setting and everything else is one hundred percent different. So maybe if you squeeze the two books together and it's take like, only the, the, the right parts, maybe you're, you're a little closer. <laughs> I, I didn't think the comparison was that apt with um, with Mickey Seven for a number of different reasons. Oh, really? Mostly because I felt like The Martian is a puzzle book, right? Yeah, that's, that's what he writes. What anywhere writes, and I, I love that kind of writing. Yeah. I can never do that. That's not something I could do. It's like watchmaking um, or like an escape room. It's yeah, yeah, exactly. yeah, exactly. Um, whereas I, I'm more about the relationships between people, and I get the feeling that maybe you are too. But maybe maybe you you could elaborate on that. A oh bit. yeah, totally. I mean, it, for me, a story is kind of nothing without a character that you can root for. You know, I really, you know, that book Save the Cat. Um, yes, it's a classic screenwriting book where it's like you have to show the character do something that you can root for, like save the cat out of a perilous situation. Then once the character saves the cat, then you're like, oh man, I like this guy. You know, I'm going to root for this guy. And, and also I, I actually, this is a little bit cheesy, but like, I believe that love is, is the thing, you know, I think um, everything we do is motivated out of love, whether it's writing a book or making dinner or carving a hiking trail. I think you do it out of a feeling of love. Um, and, and, uh, when that breaks down is when you cause problems, you know, when you start doing things out of greed or out of malice, then that's never good. Um, and, but even then you're still kind of motivated out of love. Um, you're, you're trying to impress somebody you're trying to, you're trying to win over somebody or keep somebody. Um, and so that always guides my work, whether it's like a, a teen love story in my YA books or whether it's about a dude who's like trying to find his, his wife and daughter at the end of the world. Um, Cause it, otherwise if you, I've read books that don't have that character driven, you know, um, love story, so to speak uh, in them. And they feel a little bit intellectual, like kind of up here. And mm -hmm. uh, that's not where I live. I live like kind of, kind of here ish, you know? <laughs> and also I think everything's funny. I think there's, um, a lot of uh, comedy and tragedy. I think they're really closely related. Um, oh, I see two sides of the same coin. Absolutely. Yeah. You know who and, really and, understands that is is Bong Joon Ho. You know, director of Parasite, who's going to direct. Oh, that's your, absolutely true. Yeah, your adaptation. Um, I was laughing equal parts and like and horrified equal parts, like watching Parasite. I, I think that's a fair reaction. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's about right. There, there, there's, there, there, there's. Uh, I still remember very vividly that scene in the movie where the the toilet explodes from from underneath all the characters. Is, and it's, and yeah, it's just viscerally God, hard. yeah, viscerally horrifying. But, yeah, I think yeah, that's another. At the same time, there's a lot of humor to it. I think that's another thing that like you and I share, um, sort of thematically, is um, <clears throat> physicality. Uh, you're, I, I mean, I'm, I'm only 37 pages into your book and it's, I can yeah. see the people moving. I can, you know, I can, I'm aware of what they are like and their bodies and their gestures. And I have such a strong, vivid sense of, of the physical world of the, of the book. And it's so immersive. I just love it. It's great. Well, that, that's one of the things that I found really fascinating about city of orange, because you, one of the things I really admire about other writers is when they do things that I would find intimidating or that I feel like I would have a lot of difficulty doing you, mm -hmm. you set yourself, you, you turned the difficulty up to 11. <laughs> and you, you set yourself a really tough challenge because this entire book or the, certainly the first half of it takes place in one drainage ditch. I mean, the entire, <laughs> you're, you're, it's such a claustrophobic setting to, to produce the, the sort of richness that you produce with this book. And, and even more than that, by the time you get to the end, you realize it, that the book is really confined within one man's head. I mean, the book really, the, the meat of the book takes place within Adam's head. And it's really a struggle with himself to face what the world has become and to face what his personal world has become. And that's, yeah, that's true. I, I never, never heard anyone put it like that, but it's so true. <laughs> I mean, was was that a, was that a conscious choice that you made to 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 sort of set that that difference? Because most, you know, when you're talking about writing an 80, 90, 100 thousand word book, most people want to have a world to roam through because it just makes it easier to pile up the words. It just makes you know it, it, it does, makes it easier yeah. to add chapter to chapter. When you when you when you limit yourself, like 
you've just you've made your task so much more difficult and so much more impressive when, when you pull it off. <laughs> I mean, I gotta say though that the first I wrote this as uh, Nano Rimo. You know what that is? Um, yes. National Ride a Novel Month every November. Another your goal thing is to I hit... would never have the courage to attempt, but go ahead. I, I didn't either. I didn't. This is my first novel, actually. Um, I started it years ago, before Franklin Love, before anything. Really? Um, and the only reason I started it, uh, I was still stuck in sort of the MFA mindset, like short stories, um, mm -hmm. like like those sell a lot, you know. Uh, and my wife was the one who was like, you know what? Here's the deal. I'm gonna single parent uh, for the entire month of November. And your job is to, is to beat 50,000 uh, 50, words um, in your manuscript, like get past that and, and win NaNoWriMo. And I was like, okay. And she didn't give me a choice. She was a total hard ass about it. Um, and so I did. And when I crossed that line, the finish line, I was, my heart was just pounding. Um, but it's funny, like I, I gave it to uh, an agent and she, was, she said the same thing. She's like, this is too short. You know, 50, 50K is not enough. Um, and so I started adding in set pieces and things and, and then I gave it to who my, my, uh, agent years later, many, many years later, and she gave it to my current editor and he was like, I love it, but ain't a damn thing funny. And I was like, all oh, right, it's too earnest. And it was, it was really, the first draft was really serious. Um, and I looked at it and I'm like, this is not me. I, I'm the guy who like who, you know, flips the car and the radio is stuck on my, my least favorite song in the world. And I start laughing. I'm that guy. So it has to have a sense of humor, like gallows humor almost. Um, so I put a lot of that in and it just became a whole lot better. Uh, so the early iteration was exactly kind of what you're talking about. It was too short. It was too one note. Um, and I developed it over the years to be, to be just more human, you know, and less of a, like a thought experiment um less in the guy's head because there are a lot of flashbacks and things um especially with his friend byron uh that that keep things moving you know expands the world gets you out of that drainage ditch i find the the, the process you just described i find that really surprising because there is no sign in this book that that <laughs> you've taken different pieces and patched it together this i mean this really has a feel of something that is deliberately laid out and every piece connects to, to each successive piece in a, in a, in a, in a really perfect flow. Um, oh man, thank you. I, again, it's, that's being able to, I, I, I've tried to do things like that with some of my own projects and mm -hmm. it always winds up looking like a sort of a Frankenstein's monster where you can see the stitches where I put one piece in with another <laughs> piece and it, it never has worked out for me. So I'm, I'm just amazingly impressed that you were able to manage. Man, thank you so much. It's just very, very impressive. And speaking of, again, sort of things that I find impressive, um, like I said, when, when people do things, uh, when, when writers do things, not only that, you know, I know I would have difficulty doing, but things that we're told not to do. So, mm -hmm. you know, for instance, Someone I really admire is Neil Stevenson. I don't know if you ever read much of, of his work. I have um, worked with him. I, I contributed to his uh, upcoming anthology. Oh, great, great. He's That's a great so guy. Fun. Yeah, he's one so of my yeah, favorite you people. Look at, you look at 70s, right? It's an absolutely brilliant book. But as a science fiction writer, one of the things that we're, we're constantly getting warned about is you can't do a data dump. You can't oh, did just you, explain this is did, how the world is. Sorry, did right? you say Neil Stevenson or Neil Schusterman? I said Stevenson. Okay, I don't know Neil Stevenson, oh, okay. sorry, that's a, that's but I okay. admire the hell out of that guy. He's that's okay. He's prodigious. I mean, yeah. dang. Yeah. But I mean, if you look at 70s, 70s is an 800-page data dump. I mean, the entire thing is he's just like explaining it's, how the world works. It's but like it's big. fascinating. Yeah. It's fascinating. He makes it work. It's like, it's like a magic trick. And you do some of these same things in City of Orange. So, you know, for instance, you start the book, the opening scene of, of your book, is a character waking up. I literally got yelled at by my agent for doing that once. No. I mean, that's, 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 right. that's one of the things they tell you not to do, right? You don't have a single quotation mark in the first half of this book anywhere. Um, you, you switch verb tenses back and forth in various places. You don't give your main character a name until three quarters of the way through. These are all things that, you know, that like your MFA professor is going to <laughs> yell at you for. 
but it but it works. You pull it all together and you make it work. And it, so uh, I was wondering, are those deliberate choices that you made? And and is is what what what's the reasoning behind those artistic choices? I mean, I was I was kind of rebelling against MFA, my MFA program a little bit. Like I went to Emerson College. That's where I met my wife, and that's on the East Coast in Boston. Mm-hmm. And it's very much of like the New Yorker style, you know, Penn Faulkner Foundation style writing. Right. Um, where it's very intellectual and extremely cerebral. And I admire the hell out of people who can actually pull that kind of thing off because their their intellects just scare me. Um, <laughs> and I mean, if you can do it, like, man, do it. But there's something in me that like, I, I really love, I was the guy in the writing workshop who was writing plotty, pacey stuff because I like plotty, pacey stuff. Um, and one of the, one of my teachers was, he was like, you have a literary sense, but also, I don't know how to put this shit happens in your books or in your stories. And I was like, that's one of the best compliments I've ever received. Cause I like when shit happens. Um, but here's the question. Was it meant as a compliment? Because I've had people say that to me as an insult. Yeah, totally. I, I had someone say, say like, this is good for sci-fi. So right. if you want to be a sci-fi writer, then do this. And I was like, you're, you're totally, you just insulted me. because <laughs> <You know? laughs> there's such a bias in in these mfa programs against um genre i guess mm-hmm. um but like i don't see i don't see her book as like sci- just sci-fi it's a great story and uh i just read the um the school for bad the school for good mothers by jessamine chan yep yep i also i also just read that oh my god mind-blowing right and people Brilliant. people talk about that like it's a sci-fi book it's like it's so reductive i think um to in the in the mind of sort of the mainstream consciousness they're always like oh well sci-fi is for a certain type of reader has a certain type of story and um it's just not true and so i i was kind of fighting against this when i was doing my mfa um and fortunately i met nikki and she had the same urge she has a very commercial sensibility and she didn't quite fit in the mfa program either um and so we kind of encouraged each other (laughs) to just like you know what let's just keep Let's just keep it going. Let's ignore kind of the stuff we learned in school. Keep the good stuff. Keep the craft mm-hmm. stuff. But let's keep our commercial sensibilities because it's just, we weren't even thinking about money. We we're just like it's just what we like to write, you know. Um, and so you know, <laughs> I thought about like should I start it with it was a dark and stormy night, you know, <laughs> just, like, <laughs> just like challenge myself, you know, just to break every rule in the MFA uh, three ring binder. Um, you, you make that one work, then you are my hero forever. <laughs> yeah. That's that's a challenge. Um, well, I'm, glad you, I'm glad you like that. Oh, absolutely. It, it's it's funny, you know, you say about your, your MFA program. Um, I, I went to Loyola University. Um, oh, my, cool. my mentor was a woman named Karen Fish. She's a, a poet, um, reasonably, reasonably well-known poet. Um, she also, in, in I, I took... I don't know how many classes I took from her and several independent studies. She absolutely forbade any kind of genre fiction. She would not permit any sort of genre fiction to be written. It had to be strictly sort of literary work. Um, and my first, you know, five years of, of writing after I got out of school was exactly what you're sort of saying. Short, literary short stories and getting paid $300 for one that you worked for six months on. And then oh and that God. sort of thing. Yeah. Um, yeah and it, it, eventually I came to a point of like, you know, I want to, I want to write something that I, that I would really want to read. Um, exactly. And that's, and that's where my first novel came from. And, and uh, you know, and, and it, it, it took me into speculative fiction, but I don't see, at least for myself, I don't see science fiction or speculative fiction as being sort of rockets and ray guns. It's it's a story. It's a story about the interactions between people and the relationships between people, which happens to have this this background that's fifty years in the future or hundred years in the future or you know set in a slightly different reality. But it's still the react the interactions between the people that are important. Yeah, totally. It's it's um, it's you, you just tweak one thing about reality. And just say it's, you know, 100 years in the future, whatever. And then you get to play with all these ideas and and see how your your characters adapt. And that's why I love, you know, quote science fiction so much is that it, it gives you more leeway to explore emotion. Um, there's only so many stories I can read about uh, 
you know, um, couples having problems on Cape Cod, you know, like I can't, I can't <laughs> or, or a know. professor who's having an affair with his, exactly. Student, right? <laughs> I mean, we've seen. I just, I can't, I can't read that again. Um, it's been done to death. And if you just do it, just a little dash, you can do a little dash of science fiction or you can go full on star Wars, which really is fantasy in my mind. Mm -hmm. Um, then you can really explore all kinds of things. I think it's really expansive. Um, I just was kind of, I'm slowly making my way through Ted Chang's uh, exhalation. And again, he, brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I just like, just bow down. If I ever meet him, I'll just make an ass out of myself. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I love that, that there's, um, that, that it gives you that license to, to play. And like Kurt Vonnegut, you know, he's one of my idols. Um, and they they classified him as science fiction early on because uh, I think they didn't know what to do with him. Uh, so maybe it's an honor, you know? <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, and this is one of the things that Vonnegut did brilliantly, of course. If you, if you abstract some political issue that we're having today, just a little bit by setting it in, like, in an alternate reality or setting it in the future, um, or you know what he did with Slaughterhouse Five, or what he or what he did with Sirens of Titan, where he's looking at contemporary issues, but not setting them in exactly our contemporary world. You can take people's blinders off because yeah. when you when you talk about an issue that's pertinent today, if you set it in the world today as we know it, half the people <laughs> reading it are going to say, "Hey, he's talking about me," and then they immediately get angry and they don't listen to what you're saying. Whereas yeah. if you set it well, this is actually a thousand years in the future and this is all space people. So it's not really you I'm talking about who's doing these horrible things to these other people. You can, you can sneak past their defenses and actually maybe get, get people to, to listen to what you're trying to say. And the other, the other funny, I mean, that's totally true. It's, and it's so funny that that's all it takes. It's just a little tweak, you know, put them in spaceships. Mm -hmm. um, and it also allows you to um, uh, consider to it, it it allows you to look at things that are are uh, too hard to look at in reality. Um, so like you you can't, it's really hard to talk about like child trafficking in the current context in this world. Mm -hmm. But if you set it on another planet, you know, and you give some of the people scales, um, suddenly you're able to face that horror, you know, in, in a, with a clearer head. Um, there's a lot of stuff like, especially in fantasy. Oh my God, there's so much violence and atrocity that happens in these books. But for some reason, because it's fantasy, you can face it. If it were contemporary, you'd, you'd just be, you'd be so heartbroken that you'd have to close the book, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. And have you ever, have you ever read any, um, Al Sheldon, James, James Tiptree Jr. I don't it's think going so. back a little bit. It's going yeah. back to the seventies. I'm, I'm extremely old. So I'm, I'm I'm 50. I, yeah, this is this, this is stuff I pulled off my dad's uh, off my dad's book. But she had she had a book called "Up the Walls of the World." Um, it's a great title. It, it's it it's absolutely brilliant, and it's set mostly on a sort of an alien planet. And she was the first uh, she was the first North American writer to address the issue of female genital mutilation, and she addressed Whoa. it in it. In, yeah. But, but she, again, she abstracted it. Uh -huh. and you don't realize what she's talking about until you get to the end of the book. And then it hits you like a, you know, like a baseball bat to the stomach. Yeah. That sounds fantastic. And, and you, yeah, it, I, I, yeah, I highly recommend it. It's, it's a, it's a fantastic book, but you know, that's the sort of thing you can do with science fiction that, that it's just like I said, it's much more difficult with contemporary fiction because people's defenses immediately come up. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and it also, I mean, this is really sad to say, but it feels like we call them vegetable books. Um, it's like, this book is important. It's about, um, it's right. about the horrors of war and it feels like eat your vegetables, you know? Right. Um, whereas if you set it in space, then suddenly it's not, and I don't, I can't, I have to unpack that at some point. Um, mm -hmm. but, but it, it works. I mean, I, I don't, I don't really understand why I can see in the Force Awakens like the stormtroopers gunning down an entire village, and I'm like, okay, that happened. They're really bad guys. Got it. Whereas if I saw it in real life, I'd be like, I'm turning this off. There's no way. Exactly. Yeah. 
So just to just to switch gears slightly, um, so here, here's a fun fact for you. Okay. There are 11,000 species of birds currently extant on this planet. Wow. I have never in my life seen a book with a mystical, talking, <laughs> blue-footed booby <laughs> or a titmouse. It's always crows. It's always Go crows. Go back to Norse mythology, it's the crows. You right. look at George R. R. Martin, it's the crows. It's always crows. And, and so, number one, why did you choose crows for your sort of mystical talking bird <laughs> or, or was it just the def- maybe it's just the default and that's just what we all do and and number two can you talk a little bit about the 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 purpose of of the crows in your book in city of orange and you have crows in your books too right i do yes i'm, a, I'm, I'm also a bit, but for me i i draw a lot on north I'm, I'm swedish my family is swedish and so uh-huh. i draw a lot on norse mythology and odin with his crows and that's you know, cool that's just yeah. kind of yeah, it, it, that that I, I I see where it came from for me at least. Um, but I mean, yeah, I, I, I wonder if you could talk about it a little. Well, there there there's actually a lot of crows in Los Angeles, um, and I, it's easy to ignore them, uh, which is which is weird because when you when you actually pay attention to them, they're these fascinating, beautiful, like really smart creatures. Mm-hmm. And when we had um, our daughter, she loved to point at the crows and go ka ka ka, and so. Um, mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, that's so cute. And then my next thought was, why are you pointing at the crows and not like the sparrows, you know, or any other bird? You, you're fixated on the crows. And I'm like, are we just like drawn to crows? Uh, and then the more I learned about crows, I was like, well, they can, they can use tools, basically. Um, they have problem solving skills. Uh, they're, we have this mythology where they're like a bad omen or they're um, an evil spirit. And I don't know. I just was like, this is a Californian book. You know, it takes place in Southern mm-hmm. California, uh, sort of like an inland empire ish kind of setting. And, um, and it would make sense that the crows would be there. Uh, and I love that they are, in, they have an intelligence to them, which gave me an excuse basically <laughs> to, <laughs> to have them be sort of messengers. Um, they're trying to tell the main character something. And, and that's as far as I got. So then I wrote the book and I gave it to my editor, Mark Devani, or I gave it to my agent, Jody Reamer, who read it and was like, well, I got to give this to Mark Devani at my editor at Putnam. And he read it and he was like, he loved it. But then he was like, you know, you use crows and he's kind of a, a bird hound. Um, and he's like, you know, uh, I see the crows as a messenger that the main character doesn't want to hear. And that's why he keeps literally attacking them. And I was like, yeah, I totally meant that. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> so he saw this thing I was doing without even realizing I was doing. Um, so there's something in, I think, maybe our collective subconscious that has a, a relationship to these birds that we just don't, we're not really aware of, you know. Um, but I love that they can be hated, but also beautiful and fascinating at the same time. And that that tension, I kind of exploited for the main character to, to um basically continue living in denial uh, for what, when you learn the message of what they're trying to tell him, then you're like, Oh, I see. I see. He was, he wasn't strong enough to face that truth. Right. Right. Yeah. So uh, another fun fact about crows, um, they actually can recognize individual humans and they can, oh, right. they, and yeah. they can remember if you do something bad to a crow, he will remember you and he will do his best to get back at you. Yeah. Yeah. At a later time. I mean, they're really, really, frighteningly intelligent in some ways yeah i mean i just and we so we have backyard and it's like a nature show out there um like an urban nature show mm-hmm. and they're the crows are just like they they have the weirdest behavior they don't act like any other bird out there they're like hopping the hedge deliberately searching for something they find it more crows show up and they all work together it's like it's fascinating i don't know oh, yeah I'm, I'm, I'm gonna start getting into birding i think <laughs> i really love <laughs> We have, uh, yeah, we, I live in the middle of the woods. We have a bunch of bird feeders outside. Uh, That's cool. Window. You know, we've got a big, big plate glass window and out there we, you know, we've got woodpeckers and sparrows and finches and all kinds of things always sort of hanging around. Yeah. They're fascinating. Absolutely fascinating to watch. I think it's um, like, as I'm getting older, I, I see more, I have more connection to, um, inspiration from nature than than mm. anything else really like i when i was younger i used to like i, I look at my photo stream right? i like i love taking pictures and my photo stream was like buildings and 
and graffiti and, and man-made stuff. And more and more these days, it's like people and plants and animals and that's it. Um, Cause I just realized like so much of our built world is modeled after stuff that's happening in nature, you know? Absolutely um, true. And I think, I, I think that's become my focus these days, which is kind of funny. So here's a story for you. When my oldest daughter was 18 months old, I took her to the beach and I was there with my wife. I walked out into the, the water because she, uh -huh. she was playing on the sand. It was about waist deep out in the water. I turned around, I was cradling on one arm. My wife was going to take a picture. We were waving. And then she screamed. And an instant later, I was lifted off my feet and flipped over and slammed head Holy first crap. into the sand. Dude. And I came up and she was gone. No way. Are you serious? She was gone. And I leapt up out of the water and I looked around. I obviously like the most terrifying moment of my entire life. And then I just saw a fan of blonde hair floating oh. on the water about five wow. feet away. And I dove and I snapped and she was laughing. She thought it was hilarious. She thought it was a great <laughs> thing. But I still, that, that, was, that was 20 years ago. And I still have nightmares about that moment. And it, it has infected my writing to the extent that at one point, I, I was finishing pieces and my daughter, when I handed them to her to read, because she's my first critic, would roll her eyes and say, how'd you kill me this time? <laughs> and so I think I was writing, I was writing my fears. And yeah. it was a way for me to work through and to process them psychologically so that I could sort of keep them at bay. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you might have done a little bit of that as well in this book. Is that is that something that you consciously, yeah, I mean, subconsciously thought about? Can I just say you're so perceptive? Um, I I took a uh, when I was at Emerson College again. I uh, I took a personal essay class back when we called them personal essays uh, instead of memoirs. And um, the first few essays that you know we drafted as a class, they were really stupid. Um, it's like I hate my waitressing job, or isn't beer getting expensive? It's really dumb stuff. Right. And our teacher got really exasperated, and he came in and he's like, "You guys, right?" what your greatest fear is. And then if the following day, suddenly everything was just amazing. It was compelling and gripping. And um, that was a huge inspiration for like uh, a writing prompt for myself for city of orange. Um, Cause when you, when you have, when you have a, a kid and they're just so little um, you, you become really keenly aware of how dangerous the world is and how precious mm -hmm. the baby is. And all, all I could think about is like, what if something happens, you know, um, that would be literally the worst thing that would happen to me. And so, you know, we, me and my wife would always joke, like we toss around just, I don't know, I don't know what it was like gallows humor. We're like, what if, what if I died? You know? <laughs> what would you do? And uh, she's like, if I die, you're not allowed to date anyone else. Cause I'll be a ghost and I'll haunt you. And I was like, <laughs> Ooh, oh. And I was like, if you, if I lost you guys, I would, I would always joke. I, would, I live in a van by the river, you know, <laughs> just like, and check out from reality. And we're, I mean, we're joking about that stuff, but I, I started to take that joke pretty seriously. And that was like the first sort of thread that I pulled that became City of Orange um, because so much was at stake and the awareness of it was so heightened that you can't really go back to, I saw I couldn't. So like worrying about my job title or like mm -hmm. the stain on my shirt. I just didn't care anymore. You know, that wasn't important. So that that's one, that's one of the emotional centers for the book. I think the other emotional center for the book, as I perceived it at least, um, which really surprised me at the end was Byron. It, it surprised me how much the relationship between your main character and Byron affected me at the end of the book. Can, can you talk a little bit about your inspiration for, for that character? I mean, I kind of love Byron. Someone told me, uh, I was doing an event last night and they're like, Byron kind of stole the show. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Byron is like uh, the main character's friend. Um, and he's, he is a, he's a prepper, but he sucks at it and he's kind of a hobbyist, you know, and, um, but he's super loyal to his friends and very caring and, uh, and he's just a very kind hearted person. And I'm, I have this particular obsession, like um, uh, a central dramatic question, so to speak, that I always love to answer again and again. And that's um, 
it, it kind of has to do with toxic masculinity. And uh, because my friend, my, my male friends, we're really close and, you know, we're, we're not afraid to say like, I love you and not just, I love you, man, with that big, you know, back right. hug. Um, <laughs> and I, I really appreciate that. I'm really grateful for that. Uh, when we talk, we face each other. We don't do that staring at the horizon thing, you know? Um, and so I really, I'm, I see a lot of portrayals of guys in, in films and in books where it's just like this tough guy kind of persona and it's never satisfying for me. Because it feels very defensive and kind of distant. Um, it can work, though. Like, if someone's reticent, that reticence can lead to some really awesome emotional moments. Mm -hmm. But I, I like seeing when men are open um, with their vulnerabilities and, you know, their fears. Uh, I think that as a starting place is an interesting um, jumping off point to see what happens next. Um, and so in all my books, like Frankly in Love and Super Fake Love Song and you know, version zero and city of orange i i don't i'm just obsessed with putting in really healthy nurturing male friendships um i guess because i didn't grow up with that so much either in my life or in in media the media I consumed and so i'm writing the story like you said i'm writing the story that i i would like to read and for some reason i really need to to see that portrayed um so byron really is that character he's kind of dumb you know, but you can't help but like him. He, he comes from a good place. But even now, you really don't see that that sort of relationship portrayed very often in media. You really don't. I mean, yeah. it's, it, we, we, what, what you've done in this book is is almost unique in that respect, I think. I mean, not not entirely, but um, you know, I, I'm, I'm struggling to think of other real examples along those lines. Yeah, it's, it's not it's not a lot. And, you know, there's books that deal with um, male insecurity and, you know, all the bad stuff. Mm -hmm. and that's cool that's good you got to point at that and circle it um but like what if all that was fixed you know <laughs> then what, what comes after that i think that's an equally interesting absolutely so frankly love and super fake love song are those are those are pretty straightforward ya right? yeah those yeah. are YA. um version zero is more of a techno thriller city of orange is not either of those things i mean your of what at this point is is really diverse <laughs> you know, you're, you're touching into, you're touching into a lot of of different genres. Um, was is again was that a, a deliberate choice, or did the books just sort of fall out that way because that's what interested you at the moment? I mean, I I'm kind of like a, <clears throat> a jack of all trades, just being me. Like I like to I like to do lots of different things. You know, I like to take, I like photography. I like I play music. I play piano and drums and guitar. Um, I like to make games in my spare time. Uh, like do some programming. Uh, in my previous life, I worked in the tech industry as a user experience expert for like over 12 years. Um, and so I've always been like really kind of multidisciplinary anyway. And I'm just fascinated by all kinds of things. Um, and so I think my writing reflects that. And I didn't really realize it until like City of Orange came out and everyone was like, what is this? You know, they were expecting either another version zero or another teen romance. Um, and it, you're right, it's not. Um, but I, I like that. And I, I admire writers whose careers are like that too. Like I, I just want to be a Kazuo Ishiguro when I grow up, you know, because <laughs> that dude, man, he gets to write whatever he wants. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. You're, you're not setting your sights low there. <laughs> I'm like, I, know, I know reach for the, the stars, mm -hmm. uh, but, but like, he, but you know, whatever he writes about, whether it's King Arthur or whether it's uh, clones or an AI robot, it's going to mm -hmm. have that Ishiguro flavor in it, you know, um, that hot sauce. And that's the thing that, that you want. And that's why he's always an auto buy. Um, so I don't know. I, I really admire that. I think, I think variety is, is good. And I think the world is, is just, just a, ver it's a, it's a diverse place. And there's that really comes back to the idea that the a story is, is the human heart and a story is, mm -hmm. is what's happening between and whether you said it, in a world that's got clones or, or, or a world that's, that's, you know, off in space or a world that's Manhattan in 2022. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, it's true. It, at the heart of it, it's the same thing. The and same that's, thing. I mean, that's why I'm loving your book so far. It's like, <clears throat> and I know I'm just going to jam through the whole thing. Cause it's, it's this, <laughs> he's just, he's a, he's this guy who signed on to this crazy job to be destroyed over and over again. And he's like, he's just a lost person he doesn't he's not really good at anything and he doesn't really know what he wants to do 
Um, and the fact that he gets killed over and over again gives the book this kind of Groundhog Day um, hilarity, you know? And mm-hmm. it's totally relatable. Whether it's set hundreds of years in the future or it's today, that we all have gone through moments or are going through moments like that. Um, and that's exactly what you're talking about. It's like, it's it boils down to people. Well, it's, it, you know, when uh, when I was talking to Director Bong about the, the movie. Oh, when um, I was talking to Director Bong. God, you're blowing my mind. <laughs> Just throwing that out there. Um, <laughs> one, one, of, one of the points he made was that obviously, you know, you're going for a 340 page novel to 120 page script. A lot of stuff is going to come out. And he asked me, what is the one thing that I really wanted him to retain? Uh, and he, and which I really am very grateful that he, that he gave me the opportunity to, to make that request. And the request that I made was chapter 19, which you'll see when you get there. Um, hey, chapter 19. But it's really, it's the, um, it's where you see the, the emotional connection. It's really the heart of the emotional connection between the main character and and his love interest um oh, and, that, cool. that's, and and that's all the rest of his stuff is great i love it and mm-hmm. all but but that that emotional bond that's what the book's about man now i can't wait to get to chapter and 19 no, no, matter, no matter where no matter where you said it that's always what a book has to be about is that midpoint do you think is... uh it's right it's right about the middle of the book yeah right cool right about the center of the book and that and him asking you that is that's rare i mean hollywood doesn't usually care what the he writers is, think. <laughs> he's a wonderful. He's a wonderful. He's a brilliant man, and he's a wonderful person. I, I am so incredibly grateful to have gotten the opportunity to work with him. Amazing. It's really, it's really been amazing. Yeah. So, so what are you working on now? What's what's your what's your current project? Um, well, I'm working on. Uh, I'm writing a book with my wife, actually. Um, and it's it's been awesome. Can I just tell you, like, because we we met in writing school. And so we were in our first workshops together and, you know, she was channeling Ann Beatty and I was channeling Haruki Murakami. And, you know, we, we just talk about story all the time. And we, it's been 20 years now that we've been together and uh, we haven't stopped talking about story. And so the fact that we're finally writing something together, is like thrilling. We're in a, um, a pages document and I write a chapter. She works on her chapter and then we, we swap and we go through each other's chapters. And I action up her chapters and she grills up my chapters. <laughs> and, uh, and that one's a, it's a dystopian YA. Um, but it's got this cool twist that, that's, um, I, I shouldn't talk about it anyway. Uh, and then I'm working on an, another adult book that is, um, I guess a retelling of an old story, an old favorite story. I'll say that. Uh, but it deals a lot with my particular obsession with toxic masculinity. Um, and in, in particular, like, how does, how does it happen? Cause we all start out like sweet little boys. Um, and I see it at my daughter's school, the boys mm-hmm. would hold hands, you know, and they're, they're just like intimate in the way that, that girls are allowed to continue to be, but boys are not. And I'm, I'm fascinated by that moment when they are, they realize that they can't do that stuff anymore. They can't talk about their feelings. They can't hold hands, stuff like that. Um, because that's sort of the moment that you start to shut things down in your, in your heart. And when you shut things down and clamp and like lock it up, that emotion is going to pop out in other unexpected ways and not always healthy ways. Um, and so it, that's, that's sort of what the, the story is about um, intellectually, but it's always going to be about a character who you're rooting for, who's making terrible mistakes. <laughs> I, I think that's a really uh, that's a really great place to wrap. I think we've we've got about five minutes left. Um, maybe I can turn it back over to our host for any questions we might have from the audience. Actually, I I got to tell you, I just loved your discussion. It was exhilarating, and it was for me, it was very liberating. I'll tell you why. Uh, I actually have a uh, degree in creative writing from the University of Washington. But I, I admit sometimes I, I, I um, fib a little bit about that because when I tell people that I have a, a creative writing degree, some people, they, they laugh and they say, you, you can really get a degree in that? I mean, you go up to a mountainside <laughs> and, and for two days and write a poem. But if I tell them, oh, I have a degree in English literature, they go, wow, you must be really smart. <laughs> so, so when you guys were talking about your MFA experiences, and I loved how you guys just said, forget the rules. Everything you learn, write what you love, write what you know. And for me, that's very inspirational. It's very liberating. 
So I just want to thank you guys for that. And just some of the things you said were just ins absolutely inspiring to me. So I just got I got to oh, say man. that. And uh, well, you're both extraordinary uh, authors. Um, I love David when you were talking about how this whole novel sprung from Nano I mean, so many people that have done that find it so extraordinarily um, exciting to do, and and that you took your NaNoWriMo script and made it into something big and beautiful. It's really inspiring to a lot of writers. So I just want to thank you for that too. Uh, some of the things I wanted to ask, actually, I, we have about four minutes, uh -huh. um, but one of, David, you, you were talking about uh, apocalyptic writing. And this is what I thought was really interesting is I always thought apocalyptic writing was the world, right? There's an explosion, there's a pandemic something happens outside of yourself. But what you're saying in some of your writing is an apocalypse happens internally, that it can be the loss of your health, the loss of a marriage. It, I even wrote it down, hopefully I can find it in my notes, but you, you said um, basically that changes what you, it changes the world as you see it, and that's an apocalypse. And I mean, is that what you, you did in your novel? Yeah, that, that was, I, I was really interested in the psychological apocalypse and, um, you know, City of Orange, the title, uh, it comes from people like, I'm from the City of Orange in California. I'm like, that's great. It's not about that. <laughs> it's it's uh, when I was in, in junior high school, my, my English teacher was like, would give us these writing prompts, you know, um, but they're really kind of uh, formulaic in the, in the form of rubrics. And the rubrics were always like, you know, what if you could fly? Um, what if you could turn into a cat? And one of them was, what if the world became orange? You know, what would you do? Who would you bring with you? And why would it be fun? And I was like, that wouldn't be fun. Like, are you kidding me? Everything is orange. The sky is orange. And I wrote, if everything was orange, it would be very scary because you couldn't tell where anything was and you couldn't tell where you were and you couldn't tell what anything, what the objects were. Um, and you wouldn't know where the world began and ended because there would be no contrast. It would, it, it doesn't matter if it's orange, it could be purple or, or blue. It just, what matters is, is it's one color and suddenly your world is stripped of all context. Um, and so I, I gave that answer and I think I got an A, but like, <laughs> but I, was, I never forgot that question because it's such a strange prompt. Um, it would not be fun. And when I started thinking about apocalypse and I was like, that would be a cool idea for a title. Um, because it's very, uh, it get it cuts straight to the heart of what matters to people, you know, and that's what I'm interested in most. And, and you you also said, um, survivalist survivalism sometimes is a desire for agency in the world, in, in a place where we don't have much agency. Can you tell me how that kind of worked into your novel? Uh, yeah, I mean, have you ever gone camping? Do you like camping? Uh I did it as a kid, to be honest. No, I, yeah. I, I'm, I'm not. I'm, I'm a lodge kind of guy. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, Edward, you're going to a lodge is roughing it. So. <laughs> I mean, Ed's, it's really into camping, I'm guessing, or hiking, right? Um, yeah, backpacking. Yeah. And you, you're you like, it clears your head because it, it, it strips everything away. You know, you can't really think, of, you don't have the mental bandwidth to think about um, your car payments or, or your leaky toilet because you, you're, have, you're focused on so many other basic things. So you deliberately strip down your world so that you can focus on what matters. Um, that's why camping is fun, you know? And you get dirty and you don't shower for three days and you're okay with it, but you, in a way that you would never be in your house. Um, and so like, at, I, I love that idea. I love that um, the, the survivalist, I understand the survivalist instinct because you're, Maybe your boss is a jerk, you know, and your commute is terrible and you don't even like your job anyway. And, um, and that stuff you have no control over. So if you don't give yourself some agency, even if it's the illusion of agency by camping um, or playing a video game or something, which also gives you a strong sense of agency, then you probably become a really horrible person through no fault of your own, really. Well, that's great. I mean, I just, you guys were so, so great tonight. Uh, check out their books, Edward Ashton and David Yoon. I'm holding They're your book up. on our new, new bookstore <laughs> website. 
Thank you very much. And I want to thank everybody out there. We have about 30 seconds. So thank you for watching and we'll see you again very soon. Thanks thank so much guys. for having us. It was a blast. Thank you. Really appreciate it.